Please be seated, thank you. 
Family and friends, just before we begin, can I ask you to turn your phone off, please, or to silent, or more importantly, turn it to flight mode, just that we are streaming today. It's very important that uh, we get as much data uh, to that stream as possible. Just as you're doing that, I'll... it was a blessing the other day to go and visit Joe, and uh, as we were in the room saying uh, some goodbyes, uh, we didn't think... Uh, Joe was uh, listening too much, he was asleep, but Ron was playing with a leg. And I said to Joe, he's playing with your leg, Joe, when you're asleep. And she said, up the police station. <laughs> so, she's always on the ball, wasn't she? I'd like to welcome you here today as we've gathered to give thanks, to honour, to remember and honour the life of Joanne Wisely, to say our own personal goodbye. Jo is a loved and very patient wife of Ron for 32 years, a much-loved mum to Erin and Sam, mother-in-law of Alex and Frank, a proud nana of Bella, Toby, Hazel and little Freddie. He's a, almost asleep, I hope, Sam, is he? <laughs> a beloved sister of Jacinta and Lisa, a favourite daughter-in-law of Gwen, a sister-in-law to Cheryl, Tom and Graham, and Jo is loved and missed by all of her family. And today as we look back at Jo's life and think back at the years that have gone by as we do on occasions such as this, there's a few suggestions that I can make. The first is that we all want to live a long and a happy life. And I know it's been said that a long life may not be good enough, but a good life is always long enough. And even so we'd want for ourselves and those dear to us to live a long and a happy life. Jo was a person that was straight to the point, and using Ron's words, she was the boss, and she did things her way, even till the end. She wanted that day on her own, just to, to pass and go on her own journey at the Bellingen Hospital. And from all that I know about Jo, is that she spent much of her life enjoying the good things that were given to her, especially her family and her friends, and she loved the outdoors. And secondly, Jo was a lady who was able to hold on to her lunch when others around her were losing theirs, especially if you're having a few red wines with her. She possessed a strength and a determination, and she had a wonderful cheeky smile. Jo had a treasure inside her that was unique to each person here. She contained something that made her special and valuable to you, a treasure that she imparted and impacted your life. And I'm going to ask Erin and Sam in a moment to come up and uh, particularly Erin to share a few words about her mum. But before the girls do that, we're going to ask them to come and place their candles, which you have already, and we're going to ask them to light them now. The light from the candle is a sign of Joe's spirit and presence may it enlighten the thoughts and the tributes that we share and give us hope throughout this service. And Joe, may the love and the light of your family and friends surround you and wrap you in its care and know that you'll always be in our thoughts and in our prayers. Thanks, Erin. I'm Erin, I'm Joe's oldest daughter. Just bear with me, I'm probably going to be a blub blubbering mess. Um, and public speaking is right up there on my list of fears, so <laughs> God bless you, Mum. <laughs> um, all right. Joanne Campbell was born 8th of July 1962 in Bendigo to parents Hilary and Stan Campbell. One year, one month, and one day later, she was joined by younger si sister Jacinta and then another six years later by baby Lisa, who completed their family unit. My auntie Cindy's earliest memories are of her and mum walking to Chifley Primary School. She says she remembers it feeling like a long way and recently returned to find out that it was a really long way. Times were obviously different then as they were only four and five at the time. The kids spent a lot of their weekends and holidays at their grandparents' house on the water in Daly's Point. 
They spent many hours on the wharf and in the surrounding rocks on the foreshore. By the age of six, they would be up before anyone else in the morning and get a slice of bread for bait, take their hand lines down to the wharf and catch little brim. These were far too small to eat, but they would scale them, clean them and feed them to the neighbours' cats. The rocks were full of oysters, which they would crack with a rock, wash them in the seawater and put some of them in a jar for their dad to eat later. They did manage to consume quite a few while they did this. No doubt this is where mum's love of seafood came from. Stan was posted to Adelaide when Joe was nine and completed primary school at Seacomb Gardens Primary School. Mum's sisters have fond memories of picking up their cousins from boarding school and going for picnics in the bush, driving home with a much disgraced dog that had been rolling in manure of any form that it found in the bush. The family returned to Sydney again where Joe started high school at Ranwick Girls. A favourite outing was to Cobblers Beach on the North Shore where the girls would go armed with eskies of beer, soft drink and a picnic lunch. The beach was on an army estate and they were sometimes given rides on the army duck that seemed to have to go really slow as they went past the local nudist beaches. <laughs> After two years back in Sydney, Stan got posted to England. They arrived in November and on their first Christmas day awoke to a light dusting of snow. Aunty Sydney said it was magical. Joe and Sydney got their first ever push bikes and discovered that they could go and see things by themselves. They rode for miles on the weekend, visiting nearby villages, attending events and meeting up with friends. Every Friday night, the school youth club had a disco for students. They would be dropped off by their parents at 7pm and collected at 11pm. Sydney had to remind Joe frequently to be back from the local pub before their mum and dad arrived to pick them up. <laughs> the thing that Aunty Lisa remembers the most from these early days is mum's unique sense of style. Her favourite outfit in England consisted of rainbow toe socks and platform shoes. Her love of bright, colourful clothes and her own sense of style is something she carried through her life. She was never one to go with the grain. When the family returned to Sydney, Jo decided to leave school and went to work at a bank. She discovered after a while that she hated this and went to work for an Indonesian nut factory. She then realised that to get anywhere in life, she had to go back to school and further her education. As her parents were a bit sceptical, it seems she went off the rails a bit in England, they made her pay for her own education expenses. Jo rose to the occasion and became ducks of the school for year 12. After, jo after school, Jo worked for Maya for a while and then got a public service job while she studied law part-time. The public service took her to Lismore and then to a little place called Coffs Harbour, which she'd never heard of but decided to give a go anyway. It was at this courthouse in little old Coffs Harbour that Mum met Gwen Wisely, my nanny. Nanny took a bit of a shining to Mum and decided that she was to be her future, her future daughter-in-law. <laughs> she didn't mind which son she picked as long as it was one of hers. <laughs> she started inviting Mum around for Sunday lunches and as Ron, my dad, had his licence, he got the lucky job of driving Mum home. Romance blossomed and, as, and Mum was forever grateful for being welcomed into the family with such open arms. In her last days, Mum expressed what a wonderful mother-in-law she had and how lucky she felt. Mum became Joanne Wisely when the pair were married on the 12th of April, 1986. I know Dad feels that they were made for each other. They could know what each other was thinking with just a look, finish each other's sentences. They were best friends and soulmates in every possible sense. It must have been some wedding night and honeymoon because almost nine months later to the day, their first, <laughs> their first daughter was born, me, <laughs> followed two years later by my little sister, Sam. Ours was not your typical family. Mum returned to work quite soon after I was born, with Dad taking on a lot of the childcare duties and thankfully the cooking duties. Mum had one recipe in her arsenal, curry egg and sausages, and it got burnt a lot of the time. <laughs> What she lacked in cooking skills, she made up for by being the best mum in every other way. She spent most weekends taking us out for bike rides, swimming or walks in the botanical gardens. She also volunteered for the SES, which I know she was very proud of. She was always thinking of others. As we grew up and were involved in different sports, mum always did whatever was required. She and dad both worked hard so that we could have the chance to be whatever we wanted and to follow whatever dreams we held. Mum became a judge for gymnastics to help our local team. She tried to make it to every competition, every netball game, every swimming race. She was the kind of parent I can only hope to be. 
I was not afraid to tell her anything. She was honest about her experiences and always there for advice, sometimes whether we wanted it or not. She was a strong woman, not afraid of an argument or standing up for what she believes in, a trait that luckily, or maybe unluckily if you ask our husband, she passed on to Sam and I. Mum was also a bit of an introvert. She liked her own space and she felt like an observer. I know that at times she felt like a bit of an outsider, like she didn't fit in. But I think all of the well wishes we've received and the turnout here today is a testament to her true character. She made friends wherever she went. Mum was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2013, just one week before my wedding. She kept it a secret from me until after the wedding as she didn't want it to taint my memories of our day. This pretty much sums up what Mum was like, selfless. In what was probably one of the hardest times of her life, she still put someone else's needs ahead of her own. Mum had a double mastectomy, as with her own mother passing from breast cancer at just 45, she didn't want to take any chances and was trying to eliminate the possibility of the cancer coming back in her other breast. Unfortunately, though, cancer was one step ahead. Roughly a year later, we discovered that the cancer has metastasized and was now lurking around in her bones. Given this new diagnosis, Mum was told her life expectancy was around five years. In true Mum style, she surpassed all expectations and fought a courageous battle for over seven years. In that time, she saw the birth of her four grandchildren, Bella, Toby, Hazel and Freddie, who all became her reason to keep fighting. Her grandchildren were her world, and the love and adoration was returned tenfold. All the grandkids absolutely adore their nana. Her life became about making memories and the legacy that she would leave behind. We started camping a lot as a family. She bought Sam and I a caravan each, and we plan on honouring her by continuing to do exactly what she would have wanted. Lots of family camping trips, looking up at the stars around a fire, toasting marshmallows, drinking wine and eating cheese, all of her favourite things. I mean, it's a hard expectation to live up to, right? <laughs> there are no words that are enough to express just how proud we are of Mum, of the impact that she made in the world, of the inspiration she was to others in her fight and in her life. It's even harder to find the words to express how we feel now that she's gone. She was not just a mother and a wife, she was a grandmother, a daughter, a sister, a niece, a cousin, an auntie, an in-law and a beloved friend. She lived with kindness, compassion, generosity and love. The world was a better place for having her in it. But goodbyes are only for those who love with their eyes. For those who love with their heart and soul, there is no separation. She will always be with us in our hearts and will continue living through our memories and the stories we tell. Think of her when you look up at the stars. She'll be there watching us, laughing and crying with us. I love you so much, Mum. I'm so proud to be your daughter and I'll miss you every day. But it's not goodbye. It's just until we meet again. Thank you, Aaron. And Sam. You're very brave. You're a chip off the old block, aren't they? Both of them. I'd like to open the lecture now to any family or friends that would like to come up and share something about Joe. Lisa, are you going to come up and. I'm Lisa, I'm Joe's much, much younger sister. And Joe, um, yeah, Joe was my much older sister and the stubborn one of the family. Um, I can start with that, an insult like that because it's a little sister thing um, and no one else is here to stop me. Um, <laughs> after our mother passed away many years ago, Joe stepped in to take on a mothering role, especially when our dad didn't know what to do with me. As sisters, we were always close, but became even closer when she started travelling to Brisbane each month for treatment. I would say that we weren't just sisters, but best friends. Sorry. I will greatly miss my drive home entertainment on Monday afternoons. 
every Monday I would call her as I left work and we would talk for the hour long drive home. Jo lived and fought hard for her family. Love shone from her eyes when she talked about her loved ones. Her love for Ron was humbling to see and she treasured the love they shared and the life that they lived together. My sister Jacinta and I are forever grateful to Ron for the love and care that he has always shown for my beautiful sister Joanne. Jo's pride and joy were her two daughters, Erin and Samantha, but when they met their soulmates, Alex and Frank, there were moments when I think Jo's adoration for her son-in-laws outshone her love for her girls. <laughs> As each of her grandchildren were born, Jo's love spread. Her grandchildren gave her even more reason to fight this terrible disease called cancer. Jo's face lit up every time she talked about her grandchildren, Bella, Toby, Hazel and Freddie. She absolutely glowed whenever she talked about them and treasured every minute she spent with them. Jo talked often about friends that she's met over the years, the good times. She had camping, the cruises, the trips that she took with Ron. In her last few weeks, Jo told me that she wasn't scared to die and kept reassuring everyone around her, telling us not to worry. Jo asked me to watch over her girls and her grandchildren, which I will do with honour, whether they want me to or not. Did I say that Jo was the stubborn one? <laughs> jo wanted everyone to celebrate her life, remember her fondly, keep loving each other, and live your happiest of lives. Remember her with laughter, keep telling her stories, and most of all, keep camping and drinking wine. I'd like to finish with a little poem. Oh, I miss her, our talks and her comforting voice and those random moments where we'd mutually rejoice. Rest in peace, sister and best friend, my deepest love. To the sky I shall send. Rest in peace, Joy. Thank you, Lisa. Is there any other family or friends that would like to come up and share a story? Hello, my name's Jan. Jo and I met in an, when she moved in, when she came to Crofts and we moved into a house and lived with my sister. And that's where our friendship lasted and our drinking of wine started. <laughs> and we had lots of fun and laughter and there were a lot of stories that I can't tell because of the situation we're in here. But one that I will, and Jo and I quite often talked about it, when Joanne was pregnant with Erin, she said to me, can you come and be with me at the birth? She said, I'm not sure how one will cope. And we went, yeah, righto. So I went along and I was there and then I had to go away for, to do something in the other hospital for a minute and I came back and Jo Ronald was going, quick, quick, it's coming, it's coming. And we went in and Erin was born and Jo's up there all happy and Ronald said, oh, it's like she's been on a slippery dip. And we're all there talking and laughing and then all of a sudden we hear this, excuse me, we look up and there's Jo. Can someone tell me what I've had? <laughs> we were all so happy we forgot to tell Jo. And then I became Erin's godmother and um, when Jo got sick, um, as Erin said, she didn't tell anyone. Um, I live in Mawoolumba and I had a heart attack in 2012 and Ronald and Joe came up and saw me and spent time with me and she was sick then but she didn't tell us so I didn't know so like you said Joe, Erin your mother put other people out. Sorry. you and when they used to drive up to Brisbane for treatment Joe would ring, we're five minutes down the road, put the kettle on or get the wine out, whatever comes to her. <laughs> so, and I know she loved you, Ronald's dear best friends, and life's just not going to be the same without her.
Thank you, Jan. Is there anyone else that would like to come up and share something? I was hoping somebody would come up and speak about her dancing, wonderful dancing. <laughs> Her and Ron gave us a, um, some lessons to Miriam and I, but uh, we've got two left feet. <laughs> I think Mel gave me a hand there. We, I've got a couple of stories about Joe. Uh, Ron and Joe got a few little dogs of us, uh, one called uh, Candy and Sugar. She loved her animals. And I remember Joe telling this story that every couple of days they would find these big clumps of material and foam and they couldn't work out where it was coming from. And then one day, a few weeks later, they woke up and their bums were dragging on the ground in, in bed. The dogs had got all the, the insides of the bed and pulled it out. So, but she loved them dogs and you couldn't say anything bad about them. And uh, Miriam and I and Joe and Ron used to love to go on a few trips together and we went to Gyra, uh, out to the trout hatchery and uh, we hired a convertible but it was the middle of winter <laughs> and I remember the gauge on the car saying zero <laughs> and uh, as we drove in the trout hatchery they must have thought we were idiots <laughs> and I remember looking in the back and Miriam and Joe both had beanies on and they were absolutely freezing. But Ron and I were right because we were behind the windscreen and we had the heater going. <laughs> Remember that, Ron? <laughs> and um, what was it? No, other story, Miriam? From the pub. From the pub, yes. We, the Irish pub, we got well and truly drunk at the CX club at the Irish pub. And Joe had the um, scotch eggs. Oh, these eggs that would, I don't know, what were they, marinated in something. <laughs> hundred year old eggs, you reckon? Uh, but she loved them anyway. But we couldn't stand them. Uh, sorry. And you got picked up. That's right. They both got picked up, but Ron and I didn't. <laughs> so they, she still had it. All right. We're going to now turn our attention to the screen. We've got some beautiful photos of Joe and the family and friends, and some music to go along with it.
There's an angel Contemplate my fate And do they know The places where we go When we're gray and old Cause I have been told That salvation Let's their wings unfold So when I'm lying in my bed Thoughts running through my head And I feel that love is dead I'm loving angels instead And through where Oh, she offers me protection A lot of love She won't forsake me I'm loving angels instead When I'm feeling weak And my pain walks down A one-way street I look above And I know to my bones oh, when love is dead I'm loving angels instead Mustache. <laughs> it's in every picture, isn't it? Too lazy to show. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to call upon Melissa now to come up and share the poem that's in your order of service. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there, I do not sleep. 
and the thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. I am the shining star at night when you awake to the morning light. My time has come, I am at rest. I am the sunset in the west. I am the clouds that race above where I watch over those I love. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there, I did not die. So hear these words that, I, that here I say. I am the love that guides your way. Thank you, Mel. It's not easy for everyone to get up here and speak. Uh, we'd like to give everyone an opportunity to say their own goodbye to Joe. We're going to listen to a song, The Promise, and during this time we're going to place some flowers out of the garden. Some lavender. <laughs> If you wait for me, then I'll come for you. Although I've traveled far, I always hold a place for you. me once in a while then I'll return to you I'll return and feel that space in your heart remembering your touch your kiss, your warm embrace, I'll find my way back to you if you If you dream of me like I dream of you in a place that's warm and dark, in a place where I can feel love beating. Touch your kiss, your warm embrace. I'll find my way back to you if you'll be waiting. To see your face, your smile To be with you wherever, where you are Remembering your 
touch, your kiss, your arm embrace. I'll find my way back to you. Please say you'll be waiting. Together again. It'll feel so good to be in your arms Where all my journeys end If you can make a promise If it's one that you can keep I vow to come for you If you wait for me Say you home a place for me. Family and friends, can I ask you to please stand now as we come to the most difficult part of our service, as we say farewell to Joe. And now tenderly, lovingly and reverently, we farewell Joe and wisely to nature's keeping. We wish Joe peace and eternity. She's now entered the last sleep, free of any pain, concern and care. But her spirit will live on in all of you who loved her and appreciated the part that she played in your life. And family and friends, to love someone is to risk the pain of parting, and not to love is to never have lived. The pain and the tears that you have now is the honouring of your love for Joe. And if you have any regrets today, may they be turned into gratitude for the time that you shared with her. And in a moment, can I ask you to respond with these beautiful words, Joe, with our love, we let you go. And Joe, into the arms of eternity with Hillary, Stan and Sugar and Candy, together now as your family and friends, Joe, with our love, we let you go. And Joe, into our most precious memories within our heart, together now as your family and friends, Joe, with our love, we let you go. And Joe, into your freedom and to the very best vineyard. Together now, as your family and friends, Joe, with our love, we let you go. And may you rest in peace. We're going to close our service with one final song. And during this, uh, as this song plays, we're going to ask the girls to come forward. We're going to pour a glass of grape juice and apple juice. But later on today, you're going to have the opportunity to uh, have a real drink for Joe at the uh, Comets ground or club. So I'd ask the girls to come forward as this song plays and that at the end of the song we'll do a toast to Joe. And Dad, yep, thanks Dad.
Given all the glasses out. Yeah. Somebody can drink out of the bottle if they like. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, it's only apple juice. That's it. The words on the cross stitch on your order of services were important to Joe. They say, walk tall as the trees, live strong as the mountains, and be known by the tracks that you leave. Jo's legacy lives on not just in us, but in her children and in her grandchildren. It also lives on in her arts and crafts. Cheers, Cheers to you, Jo, and, and to all your beautiful, beautiful creations and memories. And May, May she, she live on through them. Cheers, Cheers Jo. Jo. Family from the chapel, and we'll head over to the comments ground. Thank you.
Thank you. 